to begin now. Okay, well, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, good evening. Um, I see we have people from all over the world joining us, and, and it's really quite exciting. So um, I would like to welcome everyone to our first week of our Water Productivity Masterclass Series. This is, Masterclass Series is put on by the Water PIP Project, uh, which stands for Water Productivity Improvement in Practice. And this project is a consortium of organizations. Um, so first, it's IHE Delft Institute for Water Education, Wageningen University in Research, as well as Meta Meta. And they, each one of us uh, are based in the Netherlands, but we have a very international focus. Um, and, and I think many of the people who are attending today have met someone from one of these organizations at a training or at a conference. So, uh, we're very excited to be here with you today. So my name is Lauren Zielinski. I'm part of the project team at IHE Delft, and I will be helping to moderate, as well as Abraham Abishek from Meta Meta, and he'll also be helping with the IT part of things, so changing the presentations and the audio and video settings. Um, so if you haven't already, we encourage you to introduce yourself in the chat um, and say, you know, maybe your first name, where you're from, which organization you work for, and then it helps us get a better understanding of, of who we're working with and, and how we can help you guys in the future. So this is the first week of a six-week masterclass series. So today will be an introduction or maybe a reintroduction um, about the concepts of water productivity and how to monitor water productivity. And then in the next five weeks, we'll continue on with more advanced topics, so more of the master class components. And that includes how to monitor water productivity using the WAPOR database from FAO, uh, water productivity and sugarcane production, and how they interact with each other at different scales, uh, the socioeconomic components of water productivity. So it's not just the amount of crops, but it's also how it impacts the local economics and communities around them. And then the last week, we'll focus on monitoring water productivity using AquaCrop, which is another open source program from FAO. So if you would like any of the information that's um, about upcoming webinars or the recordings and presentations from previous webinars, you can visit our new project website at waterpip.un-ihe.org. Um, it's a new website, so it should be live by tomorrow morning if it's not already by this afternoon. Um, and you can also go to Meta Meta's channel, thewaterchannel.tv, and the recordings will also be there. So some of you may be new to the Water PIP project. I just wanted to take a few minutes to go over what our focus is and our objective and, and how today's webinar series fits into our larger project activities. So again, Water PIP stands for Productivity Improvement in Practice. Um, our objective is to work with different partner countries and water projects within those countries to achieve a 25% improvement in the agricultural water sector. And we would like to do this by applying different concepts of water productivity, <coughs> excuse me, as well as utilizing information from the WAPOR database from FAO. If you're not familiar with the WAPOR database, um, next week and the week after, uh, we'll go into great detail about it. Um, the main activities of our project is to develop and apply the water productivity protocols. So part of this is doing a lot of the scripting and the technical um, computer parts of it, uh, using the remotely sensed data, and then taking that and applying it to different case studies in different countries. Um, our next activity is to assess different national and regional policies that are related to water management and seeing how water productivity can combine with them and maybe improve um, particular practices in, in different countries or regions. Uh, we're also looking to support country-level development of water productivity through promoting local innovation. So that's working with local businesses and, and think tanks and organizations to develop new applications for water productivity and the WAPOR data, as well as develop knowledge hubs. So that would be working with research institutions or universities to help 
um, expand the amount of water productivity students we have and, and practitioners. And finally, uh, we work to outreach about the usefulness of water productivity to different groups and donors and organizations, as well as provide technical trainings and capacity building activities. So this webinar series is part of the, the technical training and capacity building part of it. And, and we're excited, actually, that it's online and we're able to reach so many people from around the world. And, and there'll be more activities coming up in the future. So, so we're looking forward to getting some feedback from you to really target um, how those, those trainings happen. Uh, this project is active. We started about two years ago in 2018, and will continue until the end of 2022. Um, and we're hoping it will go much further into the future. Uh, right now, we are funded by the Directorate General for International Cooperation within the Netherlands. Um, and we're working uh, on case studies, mostly in Africa and the Near East at the moment. But we really want to expand it to different areas. So if you say, oh, I live in, in Asia or I live in Latin America, I'm not seeing case studies about my region yet. Uh, we really are interested in finding new partners and working with you to make better reality. So just a, a quick agenda for who will be presenting today. Because it's an introductory uh, webinar, we'll be having a few different people touch upon a few different topics. So first, we'll have our colleague Simon Shavalking from Meta Meta. He's an agricultural and water management specialist, and he'll be focusing on water productivity as an indicator for agricultural and water use. Next, our colleague from IHE Delft, Hula Karimi, will be talking about monitoring irrigation performance across different scales. So that could be at the crop scale, at the field scale, um, a scheme, river basin. And he'll get more in details about that. Next will be Abebe Shukala, also from IHE Delft. And he'll be talking about monitoring productivity and other irrigation performance indicators. And he'll also provide a case study from Zinovada in Mozambique. And finally, we'll watch a video about social water productivity. And our colleague Petra Hellichers from Wageningen University will join us for the Q&A session to discuss more about the social and economic components of water productivity. And then after all those, we'll have, let's say, about 30 minutes to do a question and answer session. And so Abraham and myself will be the moderators for that. And we, since nobody can use their microphones, uh, we just ask that you put in your questions into the chat box. And during the presentations, Abraham will be collecting your questions. And then we'll put them on the screen, and we'll have a discussion with the panel of experts. Um, after all four presentations are finished. So with that, I think we can have Simon begin his presentation. Um, and then just one final word while we're transitioning here is that um, so in the Q&A session and after the end of the, the webinar, we'll send you to a link to a survey. And this survey is to tell us more about you and how you would like to use water productivity and how we can target um, our trainings in the future. So you just need to fill out the survey once. So if you plan on attending multiple webinars, maybe you can fill it out in a few weeks. Um, but it's really important to us that we get a good understanding of who you are, how you use these concepts, and, and how we can improve our training components. So thank you very much. And now I'll hand it over to Simon. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Lauren. Thank you, Lauren, for the introduction. Um, to kick off with this masterclass, I would like to dive into water productivity as a concept and how it can serve as an indicator for agriculture water and water use. But before bringing up the indicator and explaining the numerator and denominator, I would like to explain why water productivity is brought up and explain in this series of masterclasses. So why water productivity? Why this series of masterclasses on water productivity? Also considering that masterclasses have been held before on the topic in 2017, which by just to remind are available on the Water Channel. Well, simply said, the Netherlands Ministry of Foreign Affairs has embarked on a distinct course in agricultural development, being that of increasing food production whilst maintaining or reducing water consumption in agriculture. 
This course is seen as an important one to tackle global growing water scarcity. This wordle just highlights what UN uh, water scarcity first name page shows in terms of word count. As you can see, it's water scarcity people. We all know the uh, implications of scarcity. It can be in wet and dry areas. Which, if considering non-consumed water, can be repurposed and if the food produced also actually is eaten, really makes sense. This course, this course of the ministry has meant to meant projects that were supported by the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs would need to comply to improving water productivity. But also the policies of countries that are being collaborated with would need to learn to address this and knowledge and expertise would need to be developed locally. This meant that when putting water productivity improvements in practice, we would really need to explain, visualize, draw in collaboration and cooperation and expose the full dynamics of water productivity. Why now again? Well, there's an advancement in understanding the possibilities and increasing the le level of detail of data, which is becoming available on the open source WAPO portal developed by FAO, as well as the opportunity to field validate the data with field practice through, amongst others, crop growth models such as AquaCrop. So a lot has been developed in over the past three years. So water productivity, the more crop per drop, as how Netherlands policy makers framed it, could be a starting point to explain. But before diving into the numerator and the denominator of water productivity, it is maybe good to know that the concept evolved from different fields that were looking at water use efficiency. Crop physiologists, as shown here, started looking at how plant would grow the amount it would transpire, or sweat, which would later on be coined as beneficial water use, or beneficial consumption. They later expanded it to also include how much water would evaporate from a given planting area. This water evaporated would later on also be called the non-beneficial water use, or non-beneficial consumption. Irrigation specialists would, well, simply said, consider water use efficiency as how effectively water is delivered to crops and how much is non-consumed. This leaving out the most important part of what crops, crop is actually able to do with the delivery of water. But then again, that was the concern, obviously, of the crop physiologists, what a plant does with the water in the soil. An important point that irrigation specialists or water management add, however, is that non-consumed water, as depicted here, may, by virtue of it infiltrating or running off into surface water, become usable again, also called a recoverable fraction. This opportunity of reuse then implies that water applied and not consumed the first time may be consumed the second or third time around. However, Water that is applied to crops often dissolve salts and fertilizers, which affects the quality of water and may eventually imply that water is not suitable for all purposes. Reusing would then come at the cost of reducing the amounts of load of fertilizers or salts or any other materials that have accumulated. And it could also just be simply considered a lost water. So as to engage both fields of expertise and go way beyond also the biological crop processes and that of bringing water from A to P, the plant, the concept of water productivity comes in. Now, although it is good to remember that at the heart, the crop physiologist definition is actually the one that won. Depicted here is water productivity, the amount of kgs per evapotranspiration. So the amount of kgs per cubic meter of water consumed. Water productivity is the amount of kilograms per drop, or otherwise said as 
mentioned the amount of crop yield per amount of water use for making that crop. The kgs I showed in this equation are the nominator, and the water is the denominator. The outcome of this equation is a number. Now, as I want to show from these numbers for cereals in the table, in this case is that improving water productivity can both come from the nominator side, meaning to improve yields, as well as from the denominator side, meaning to reduce water consumption. Now, if you look at the output or the denominator, the kgs per cubic meter, the cubic meter may, in the case of the indicator, seem as a fixed cubic meter. But when considering how the results of the equations are established, that cubic meter is, when comparing two different systems, able to achieve a lot more. So that's the important things to remember with this equation. And here is where the irrigation engineers and water managers, managers come into play. Because it is the irrigation engineers that would have to readapt schemes to be able to accommodate these savings. And water managers to determine what can be done with the water saved. The crop physiologists, farmers, agronomists, play the pivotal role of actually achieving the same or higher yields in the given circumstances. In summary, water productivity, when considering the kgs per cubic meter, it is always important to remember the composition of the equation, considering the benefits, i.e. the yields, and the costs, i.e. the water consumed, which opens the door for me to introduce other nominator options that are also running around and very important to consider when discussing water productivity. These include, for example, nutrients, per drop, or money per drop, or jobs per drop, or even sustainable livelihoods per drop, which we'd call social water productivity. These nominators bring in, as you can see, the complexity of choice with regards to the benefits and costs. And this complexity is determined by what would a farmer, a scheme operator, or a policy ma maker need to or want to achieve, right? So it's a complexity of choice again. Finally, to add to all these considerations, and certainly not least important, is that the amount of food produced on farmers' field is much more than is currently necessary for the global population. So the losses between farmer and, let's say, our dinner table is equivalent to a loss in water. And consequently, reducing this food loss and wastage reduces water needs in agriculture. So this is another important consideration to take along when we look at water productivity, and particularly the aspect of water use and production. Now coming to practice about water productivity. In rain-fed agricultural systems, water harvesting can play an important role to reduce the amount of water lost by direct evapor evaporation. This can often be very high in rain-fed systems. And it can increase the water available for transpiration, as we showed in that picture, the plant actually transpiring the water and using it to grow. Elements that can improve water productivity would be water harvesting. And then we are not looking only at soil and water management practices, such as mulching, adapted plowing, but also certain systems of agroforestry, windbreaks, and looking at adapting microclimates. All of this really focused on reducing the evaporative losses. We could also look at alternative crop varieties, which could mitigate the impact of dry spells, and also looking at the soils and improving soil fertility. These can further enhance, let's say, the beneficial consumption by the plants. In irrigated agriculture, reducing the amount of irrigation would be a first, also known as deficit irrigation, a irrigation where you are using less water. 
But essentially also the soil status is very important in an irrigated agriculture. Soils are essential substrate for moisture, nutrients, and microorganisms, as well as oxygen. And in irrigated agriculture, all these elements can become run down. Water may start to log, soils may turn saline, to name a few. Underlining the importance also of thought out drainage. Other systems that exist in agricultural production, such as spate irrigation or recessional agriculture, which make use of floods, are actual production systems in which farmers typically already take duly consideration of risks and uncertainties. It's a production system that are very much based on risk and uncertainties. And this is important to consider because in systems such as irrigation, there is a lot more adaptation possible. Right? So I wanted to bring these systems up as well. Now, I've tried to highlight that the concept of water productivity should serve as a goal that can bring together various stakeholders in agricultural water management. This is from farm to agronomist and to irrigation engineer and water managers. But also considering the extent of costs and benefits, the social and economical aspects that the decision making relate to it is important that policymakers such as also the Dutch understand the concept of water productivity. Livelihoods and field reality, including the risks and uncertainties related to them, need to be understood by policymakers and vice versa to have policymakers make right decisions with regards to prioritizing and distributing or redistributing water for all its usages. It is when we start unraveling the farmer dynamics that we can also specify real impacts of improving water productivity in production systems. It is in that sense not an end in itself, water productivity, i.e. achieving the highest water productivities, but I see it as a means to determining the most appropriate production systems in a given context, also when we can compare with other similar contexts. This is where I would want to leave the presentation, as it is now, um, knowing that it is not a very lengthy presentation, but you're very welcome to follow up with any questions that you have, and I'll be available later. Um, I've also specified the open resources that I've used. Uh, this presentation will be available later online as well, so feel free to browse through and look at the resources that I've used. Or uh, Thank you very much. Yeah, over you to you, Lauren, again. Thank you, Simon. That was a really nice introduction, a reintroduction for some of us um, about water productivity and, and what it means as a concept. Um, again, we'll be posting these presentations and the recordings on uh, the IHE website as well as uh, the Water Channel, so there'll be opportunities for you to go through and look through some of the resources and reread the slides if if you missed something. So now I would like to move on to Poulad, uh, and he can talk about monitoring irrigation performance across different scales. Yeah. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, I'm very pleased to, to, to have this opportunity to actually speak to you guys, and then it's very nice to, to have you participate in this, uh, this presentation. Simon has already put water productivity in a very good context. So, we begin, as Simon explained, on water productivity concept being the output per water consumed. The output uh, would be different things as we, we, depending on our intended use, and also water consumed would be depending on different uh, factors. Basically, the numerator here depends, depends on the, in, it goes back to the which crop are we talking about? What what are we? What scale are we discussing? What kind of benefit are we getting out of it? And the denominator relates to what drop. I mean, where this water is going. What water consumption are we speaking about? And how do we how do we come up with different 
uh, basically understanding of at what scale, what do we use? Because there are so many scales that we have, and there could be so many relevant definitions for each of these uh, non numerator and the denominator. Basically, if you look into the Irrigation Act as a practice, we have different scales. We start with a crop, and we go on to the field. That's basically a plot of land that one crop is being cultivated. And then we go on to a farm scale. Farms typically a land that is managed by a farmer, but there are multiple crops there, and there could be livestock and other activities within a farm. And then we have an irrigation scheme where there is like number of farms, and that depends a lot on the size of an irrigation scheme. We have this irrigation schemes as small as, say, 20 hectares, and it can go up to millions of hectares, an example, in Pakistan or India. And at the end of the road, there is a basin. So all these systems are located within a basin. So it's important to see all these activities connected to the basin around them. So it's one of the most important concepts around water in agriculture. For us to understand as agricultural specialists, as an irrigation engineer, as an irrigation practitioners, that everything happens within the context of the basin. Every component is related, and we have to always understand where we are and then how do we connect with the higher level and lower level. For instance, if we want to change a practice within a basin, we have to decide at a basin, but we have to implement at farm level or field level through the help of manager of an irrigation scheme. So we would need to understand different cons I mean, water productivity at different scales. Starting with a crop. A crop would be, it's a single crop that we are talking about here, and this is where our production or our numerator is based on physical production of biomass or yield, and that can be measured by kilograms. When we talk about a crop, a single crop, our water consumed or our denominator would be only transpiration, because as you may know, only transpiration is the process that leads to biomass production. Hence, we only, at the crop scale, we only think about transpiration as the water consumed. And this is the purpose of doing this is mostly to understand what are the what is the what is what is the ability of the a plant or a crop in conversion of bio the energy to biomass or harvestable yield, and this is very relevant to plant physiologists or even farmers who would like to have varieties of a crop that actually produce more with a, with a less input or more with a similar amount of input, hence improved water productivity at this level. The next level is a field. At a field, we have one single crop being cultivated over, a, over an area. So here again, we talk about kilograms for the, for the output part, and that can be biomass or it can be yield. And then our water consumption now is moved on from being only transpiration, being transpiration and evapor evaporation, or in short, evapotranspiration. So this would be evaporation from the soil, and as we connect it back, it would be transpiration from the plant. And this can be used to, to assess the biomass and harvestable yield in relation to what amount of water consumed. So that is the, that's how we can, we can assess at the field level how much of water productivity do we have. And this could also be important and very useful for farmers to understand, because they would like to know what is the what is the water productivity of specific uh, crop that they do over a field, and also from the soil and crop scientific or scientist interest that they would like to help us to increase this water productivity. So the next step would be at the farm level. So at a farm level, we have multiple, I have to change the, the title there because it reads field, but it, it is a farm level. Uh, at a farm level, we have multiple activities. We have multiple crops. That changes some of the equations. So when we have, say, maize, wheat, sorghum, alfalfa together, we can no longer only base our, our, our calculations on kilograms produced, because inherently, the crop production has different aspects in, in, in wheat 
than maize. A wheat would be around, say, on average, you could say around 4 pounds per hectare, but maize could go up to 6 to 7. So we cannot compare the kilograms of maize to kilograms of wheat because they, have, they are inherently different. That is why we bring in an economic on, or monetary term. What we will do is to actually look into the market value of wheat and market value of maize and try to convert everything into dollar value or into a, a, a kind of uh, monetary value of a certain location, whatever that works better. So you usually use dollar to, be, to make it comparable with internationally. However, for local studies, you can always use your own uh, currency. So, and the water consumption here could also be defined in two other ways. I mean, we can all still look into evapotranspiration, go after the net water consumption or water cons the consumptive use, or we can also look into irrigation supply because at this level, there's a lot of deliveries. And then the interest in delivery is also important because the, far, the irrigation managers, the farmers also are interested about seeing how much crop is produced per irrigation supply. So again, we would like to do this to understand our yield or economic value of our product against the water consumed. And that can be broadly used by the agriculturalists and farmers and also at a higher level to, to kind of see in how a certain farm is productive in converting water to benefits. At another level, or a level higher, we will have our irrigation system. An irrigation system, as I said, is a number of, is, is a large area providing water through canal system or sometimes through a conductive use of groundwater and canal system with, with quite a number of irrigation fields and farms. So at this level, again, we have, we can use, look into bio, to water productivity from kilogram produced in terms of biomass or dollar in terms of the value of the crop that has been cultivated. And if we add the livestock, who is actually maybe using this water, that can also go and lump within this uh, economic water productivity part. The water terms here are irrigation deliveries, depletion. Depletion is again that similar to net consumption or consumptive use that we have. And the total available water. That's important because for the planning phase at the irrigation management scale, we would like to increase or some, somehow optimize our level of benefits against the available water that we have in our irrigation system. And that can be used for assessing irrigation system performance in terms of the harvestable yield or economic returns in comparison with water consumed. And the users could be a broad range of people from, again, even farmers could actually look to these numbers and also compare themselves with the other, other, other farmers within this team. And also is useful for irrigation engineers and water managers to, to understand how the system works and how we can improve this system down the line. At the next level, this is where our basin and, uh, sits. The basin is actually host to everything that we have. It would be our irrigation system, rain pit systems, forests, wetlands, urban areas, industry. All the water consumptions are sitting at the basin level. So there would be multiple sectors in play. And that is where we look into, when we look into water productivity at broader scale, we, we look into to the economic, economic value of production. That could be a loan for the cropping system, or it could be combined with other sectors. So, even if you have a method, if you have methods to actually do come up with those values in terms of economic uh, returns, you can always see whether which sector is more profitable and where. And the water consumption here, water terms could be entire available water for the system. So when we look into the basin, we let me say, okay, for, for this basin, for instance, for the Nile basin, we have 2,000 billion cubic meter of water available to rain within a certain year on average. So then we look into what are the benefits that actually drive or produce using this amount of water overall the basin. This would be everything that we have in the basin from the direct use of rainfall into our rainfall system or, or into our forests or wetlands up to, to our irrigation system. So you can look into this whole irrigation system or agriculture as a whole and only focus on the crop water productivity, or you can have a broader point of view into 
general water productivity across the system. And the purpose is to understand water allocation, to guide us in making decisions on water reallocation, understanding of how much water is actually uh, uh, profitable and productive is in uh, agriculture uh, practices and how our irrigation systems across the basin are producing benefits for us. And it can be used by, by water managers at basin level, hydrologists, policymakers, decision makers, and all sorts of people that are having a stake in decision in making decisions at the at the at the basin scale. Beside the water productivity, we do have other performance assessment uh, criteria that are relevant to, to irrigation and then to understanding how we can improve irrigation. One very important one is adequacy. Adequacy to in a in a in a simple definition is actually the ratio of water the targeted deliveries to the actual deliveries. For instance, say I have a hectares of uh, one hectare of wheat and I have been promised six thousand cubic meter of water over over a season. So, but that's my target. Maybe a system does not give me that much, and I actually have received four thousand. So my adequacy would be up to two thirds, so nearly sixty percent. And that would affect my, my production. Hence, it's very important for us to understand within an irrigation system how much of ad adequacy have we had through the season. So we calculate this based on the comparison, comparing our seasonal actual evapotranspiration and our potential evapotranspiration. The actual evapotranspiration could be derived from models or remote sensing or field surveys. Uh, and then the if the potential evapotranspiration can be calculated using the, the definitions that we have and also the assumptions that we have on the uh, crop coefficient. And also, in another practical matter, way when we use remote sensing by looking into higher percentile of actual EPA that is occurring within the same area. The other indicator that we use is uh, for adequacy is relative water deficit. Relative water deficit compares the actual evapotranspiration with the maximum crop evapot evapotranspiration. This is very important because it also, the same, the similar ratio applies to yield against yield maximum. So if you have, say, 60% less ETA over uh, ET, ET maximum, we can calculate based on the crop and the, based on the, the type of the response and at different stage of the growth of the crop, how much yield reduction will we have in towards the end of the season? To do that, we, we have uh, the FAO 66 uh, publication has the graphs and the, the sensitivities at different stage for different crops. So you can refer to that to see how your crop will be affected by this water deficit different at different stage of the crop growth. Then the next criteria that is very important is reliability, which is speaks to the how reliable has been the system towards delivering ir irrigation water and time for, for the use. Basically, irrigation is not only a seasonal act. It's for over a season, we have, say, seven or eight irrigation or five irrigation events. And it's very important for us to get water at the, at the, at the right time, at the right month. So the right timing can only be seen towards looking at the reliability. Imagine a system provides the first irrigation, but for the second irrigation, we don't have, we don't, we wouldn't have uh, enough water to irrigate, or my farm doesn't receive water. So my crop goes through stress, and then I lose a lot of my, a lot of the output that I was supposed to gain. So reliability is very important factor in a system. The other criteria that is very important is equity. Equity is about the degree of fairness towards water distribution. So typically, if you look into the to the to the, to the uh, schematic view of an irrigation scheme, typically we have much higher water availability in the head reach, and then much lower water availability at the tail. And this is the story that happens almost all over the place across the globe. So it's a typical problem in an irrigation scheme. So that means that people who have been sitting at the tail have not had a fair chance compared to other people who are actually at the head reach, to have water for their agriculture and for their irrigation practices. And you can imagine those would be deprived from uh, having enough 
outputs for, for, from their fields. So this is another indicator that we would, we would be looking at, we could be looking at uh, using remote sensing and also using the indicates that we can drive from remote sensing for water productivity. And we can do that using looking at the evapotranspiration and how it varies the, the, the CD of evap spatial variation of evapotrans actual evapotranspiration, which we are a CD of ETA. So I think next example that will be provided by, by Abete would actually show a good case study that, that how these indicators have been calculated for a certain uh, area in, in Mozambique. So in summary, water productivity has different numerator and denominator across the scale. It's very important for us to understand the scale that we work, to pick the right numerator and denominator, and to understand what is it, why are we doing what we are doing in different scales. Also to understand how these scales are connected when, when we would like to create a change or we would like to introduce intervention. All these things need to have, need have to be assessed and all these things need to be have need to be seen together. Uh, also, we looked into the uh, other performance important performance uh, indicators for irrigation, which are ad adequacy, reliability, and equity. These are important to ensure that we have adequate water grow crop, we have reliable service delivery, and we also have good level of fairness and equity in our irrigation system. Thank you very much. And these are the, by the way, the some of the references that I've used, and all are open source. You can always download them and then read much more about the the information that I provided in this presentation. Thank you. Very nice presentation, Pulat. It's it's really interesting to see the different scales, and if you are a, a water manager or or a farmer, you can knowing what scale you work at and which which indicators and and parameters you need to work with would be really useful to know at the, the planning stage, but also during the execution and monitoring. So very interesting. Um, next, we have a presentation by Abebe, and he'll be continuing on and talking about monitoring productivity and other irrigation performance indicators, and then applying them to the case study of Zinovane in Mozambique. Oh, I think you're still on mute there, baby. You might have to unmute yourself first. Okay. Thank you, Lauren. So my presentation will build on the previous uh, two presentations by my colleagues, Simon and uh, Pulat. Then it will uh, try to apply the concept into real world problem. And it will be on monitoring biophysical productivity and other irrigation performance indicator at irrigation system level, uh, which will be the case for uh, uh, Sinavana. And uh, it's a work done, of course, with uh, my colleague, uh, Marlo Smul and uh, Pulat Karimi. And one of the things happening uh, fast is the sugarcane uh, plantation, which is expanding. And that is, in fact, the reality uh, in Africa. Uh, but then somehow that one, uh, that expansion is of course driven by uh, so many interests, at least to mention is energy driven, uh, which is bio, uh, biofuel, uh, bio, uh, and, and also uh, driven by consumption for more sugar. Uh, but then that uh, increasing uh, production uh, from, uh, of sugarcane by expansion somehow under uh, overlook the uh, the increasing production from the existing irrigation system. Uh, then that is, uh, of course, uh, happening or the reality all over Africa, uh, but uh, it's not also different uh, for cases in Sinavana, which is in Mozambique. Uh, then uh, the question is, can we identify uh, best performing uh, spots within uh, irrigation system, and can we learn uh, smart management practices, and can we let's improve still the production from existing irrigation scheme is equation. So my presentation will have an objective to provide insights into uh, water and land productivity, and also other irrigation performance indicators, and also identifying bright spots from which we could learn best management practices. And this will be uh, 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 analyzed for Sinavana sugarcane state uh, 
uh, uh, which is segmented by irrigation method. Uh, and then it will be for five uh, seasons. That is from 2014-15 up to 2018-19. So the irrigation system I am referring in those uh, in this area, Sinavana, is uh, typically uh, uh, divided or segregated into three. Uh, the one that you see here, uh, the circular one, blue, is the spring, uh, the center pivot, and the uh, square block uh, with the uh, here uh, in the center is the furrow irrigation system, and the rest are a mixed irrigation system, which is a combination of uh, sprinkler and furrow. Then, how we uh, achieved uh, our objective? So we have used data from Vapor. For those of you who do not know what is Vapor, uh, you could uh, follow this link. It is a FAO portal to monitor water productivity through open access of remotely sensed driver data. And we have used uh, four layers of water consumption and production related data and also uh, uh, one layers of land co cover classification, plus other local informations, which helps to filter out a non-crop from the layers. And then using those uh, data, uh, we first aggregate them into the seasonal basis, and then calculated uh, those indicators that you see here. Of course, the definition are pretty well explained by at the previous two presenters. So water consumption, beneficial fraction, equity, adequacy, reliability, water, and land productivity. Uh, then the next step is uh, identifying the productivity target, which is defined by 95 percentile of both biomass water productivity and uh, land productivity, which is just the biomass itself, and then all uh, pixels or let's say spots which have a productivity beyond those targets are identified as uh, bright spot. But then those bright spots, of course, traced also geographically across the area where they happen exactly uh, on the on the in the scheme, and also they are traced uh, let's say across all the season how frequently they happen at a particular spot, and then. Uh, this, of course, will take me into the result, but before that, let's say the definitions uh, could be also uh, referred from um, those references I, I placed here, and also the methods and the data, of course, will be explained very in detail how to download and how to do the analysis in the subsequent webinars, and also you could read here the, uh, the, the links uh, shown here at the bottom of the slide. So the first result is uh, in the left is water consumption, seasonal water consumption. As you could see here, especially there is a difference in water consumption from about thousands and up to, let's say, uh, 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 1,600 and even beyond. So the water consumption here around the center pivot is higher compared to, for instance, the plots identified as or to be irrigated by furrow irrigation. And of course, this happened not only for one season, that is 2017-18, also across all the five seasons. And then it shows that center pivot to have the highest consumption compared to furrow. And then the other beneficial fraction, uh, the other uh, uh, sorry uh, indicator is beneficial fraction. Also here clearly shown uh, the beneficial fraction, which is the transpiration over actual evapotranspiration is higher at center pivot irrigated pixel or spots compared to, let's say, furrow or other uh, or other spots irrigated by the mixed irrigation system. And the equity also compared, let's say, across area and also uh, uh, segregated by those irrigation, uh, the three irrigation uh, methods uh, I, 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 uh, I described. And here we found that the coefficient of variation of actual ET is the lowest always or in all season under uh, center pivot compared to, for instance, uh, furrow. So what does it mean is the equity is higher or it is the coefficient of variation is 
the uh, the uniformity is higher under center pivot if compared to furrow irrigation method. And of course, we have different threshold to say if it is good uniformity, fair uniformity, or poor uniformity. And of course, al along across all this area in Sinavana, we found that the equity, the uniformity is from uh, good uniformity to fair uniformity. So next is adequacy. And the one that compared uh, what is uh, currently used uh, to uh, what is, let's say, uh, required, or what is at least promised as well it can be. And then here we found also the furrow irrigation is not, let's say, uh, or has low adequacy if we compare with uh, the center pivot. And uh, those are also traced across seasons. And then that will lead us into reliability. And we found that more or less the water delivery or water use in Sinavana is closer to acceptable range of reliability, except for some years, for instance, in 2015 and 2016, the reliability, I mean, it, it is lower compared to the, and also in 2018-90, it's lower than uh, the other seasons. And here uh, I come to biomass and uh, biomass water productivity. So the biomass also seem to vary across the, 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 the areas. And then we found the biomass at, uh, at areas irrigated by centripetal to be higher than uh, other uh, areas or other spots irrigated by other irrigation systems. In fact, we compared also the biomass we estimated with uh, FPO stats for Mozambique. And the, the one the, here, the, the lower that you see uh, uh, is uh, a biomass and yield uh, in the y-axis and, of course, uh, along all the five seasons. And the, the, co the, the bar at the, at the, the fourth bar is the data from April start. And here you might see it's a bit lower compared to the biomass estimate uh, uh, of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, under other irrigation system, the three irrigation system. But of course, it can be justified because we are talking for the three bars biomass, but then for the data from FPO, it is the yield. So uh, the explanation is, first of all, it's harvest index. And uh, the other is uh, uh, explanation could be uh, the FPO stats uh, report yield across all Mozambique, which also included uh, the sugarcane production and the rain-fed agriculture, which is, of course, much lower than uh, the production under irrigated agriculture. And then to the right is the biomass water productivity. Uh, of course, you see the biomass productivity map opposing in terms of comparing irrigation technology to the biomass. Here you see uh, the center pivot to have the lowest biomass water productivity uh, uh, than furrow or other irrigation system. And of course, that is consistent throughout the five seasons. Of course, the margin could be very small, but always the water productivity by furrow uh, is much more than or higher than the water productivity by uh, uh, on areas irrigated by furrow, uh, by uh, center. Sorry. And here we compared all irrigation uh, technologies across the Sinavana. And uh, based on, of course, the 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 all uh, indicators. And here, what we could learn is there is no one single irrigation technology that stand out to be the best, uh, uh, having let's say good indicators of all. So next, we come to the identifying bright spots. So as I already defined earlier. Uh, the bright spots for biomass is taken as 95 percentile uh, of the biomass. And then, of course, that is stressed in the lower graph. Is uh, It shows where those spots are there. And also, the biomass water productivities are stressed here. The red spots are those areas which have a biomass water productivity greater than the 95 percentile. And then at the end, we identified the intersection of the two. Those are spots who fulfill both criteria. That is the spots which have higher both uh, biomass 
as well as biomass water productivity. So we identified for one season, and we did this for all five seasons. It means we trace those spots across the five seasons, and we found out that uh, the areas or spots which appear most frequently, or four times out of the five seasons, are located uh, to the west side of uh, the Sinavana scheme, which are not within uh, areas irrigated by center pivot or furrow irrigation. So this will bring me uh, to the end. That is the conclusion. Then we already have seen that uh, those indicators, biomass as well as other irrigation performance indicators, can really be used to answer a real problem, let's say. One of the challenge is, OK, can we spot out a best uh, production, uh, uh, the bright spots, uh, within uh, the same agroclimatic zone? That's what we have did. And also, we compared irrigation technologies if uh, one is better than the others. So what we found is there is no one single irrigation method that stand out to be the best uh, in all indicators. There is always a trade-off. Uh, for one or the other irrigation uh, performance indicator if, if we choose this or that uh, irrigation. Of course, this is based on only this study, which uh, required, of course, to be uh, validated in other cases. And we have found that center pivots who have higher adequacy land productivity uh, and equity, but that is, uh, of course, compared to furrow, but that is also at the cost of low water productivity, and it uses excess seasonal water consumption, which is beyond even the required water. Uh, that's, of course, is nothing to do maybe with the technology itself. It could be how we are managing the whole system. And then we found that uh, water deficits might not be, uh, let's say, the underlying problem for the variety, the variation which is happening between these irrigation technologies. That's the difference in land productivity between those technologies can be attributed to other farm inputs, such as water logging, uh, or, or it could be other problem like water logging and salinity, which of course require further investigation. So the bright spots from which best management practice could be learned uh, are identified at, at areas irrigated by mixed irrigation system. And that's, uh, let's say, the lesson of applying those concepts into answering those real uh, problem on the ground. Uh, thank you very much, uh, and uh, see you later with question and answer. Great. Thank you very much, Abebe. It was a really nice uh, showcase of how the, the concepts that Pula describes in his presentation get applied in the real world, and of course, how things get much more complicated when, when you do that. So. Thank you very much. Um, again, we encourage you guys to ask questions. Um, so please put your questions into the chat. Uh, if you have a specific speaker that you would like to address, please include their name. Um, but in the meantime, we will uh, move on to the social water productivity. So we'll be sharing a, a short video short uh, on this topic. And then during the today session, uh, uh, Petra Hellehers will, will help us out. So Petra, yeah, would you sure. like to introduce uh, Thank you, Lauren. Uh, well, I'm also very pleased to have this opportunity. And I look very much forward to the masterclass on the 1st of July. So I see this a little, little bit as a trailer or a teaser. And, and I really hope that the questions you will pose will help me to prepare for the 1st of July so that I can incorporate the answers. Uh, as indicated already by the previous speakers, uh, there's no one definition for water productivity. And similar, that also holds for the societal, so, social water productivity, as there are different performance indicators. Eh? Countries um, can have different societal objectives, like poverty alleviation or food security, or food self-sufficiency, or an equitable distribution of water, or equitable distribution of the, the revenues generated by water. And I think in this video, uh, it's nicely shown that also the benefits can be distributed differently, yeah, which you generate with the water. And that's precisely what uh, the, um, the socio-economic water productivity is about. So yeah, let's have a look at the video, and then I'm uh, willing to answer your questions. So. Yeah, thank you.
In agriculture, water productivity is the amount of value in terms of socio-economic benefits, services and jobs created per unit volume of water consumed. The different stakeholders involved in agriculture receive different proportions of this value. For example, let's look at this pineapple. It was grown at a plantation in Costa Rica and is being sold at a supermarket somewhere in Europe. Research shows that of the revenue from the sale of this pineapple at the supermarket, 21% will go to the plantation. Within that 21%, 17% will go to the plantation owner and 4% to the worker. Social water productivity is an idea that describes how equitable is the distribution of value generated from agricultural output per unit volume of water used. Social water productivity can be used as a parameter for decision making when it comes to allocating the water available in a river basin or an irrigation scheme. For example, in southwestern Peru, a project was proposed to divert annually nearly 300 million cubic meters of water from the mountains, where it was being used by small subsistence farmers, to commercial grapes, asparagus and avocado plantations near the coast. The government initially approved the project on grounds that grapes, asparagus and avocados were high-value export crops and would yield much greater returns per unit volume of water. So this would be a more productive use of water. And this was kind of correct. The net income per 1000 cubic meters of water used for asparagus was around $935 about five times the return from subsistence farming of staple crops such as beans by small farmers in the highlands. But on closer examination, it was revealed that plantation owners would have pocketed most of those $935. Plantation workers or small farmers in the area would have earned only $75 per thousand cubic meters of water, which is only half the benefits being drawn by farmers in the highlands. This shows that the social water productivity would have been higher if the water was used for smallholder cultivation in the highlands than if it was diverted to plantations on the coast. The discussion around boosting water productivity is invariably a discussion around competing uses and trade-offs. This is especially true in arid or semi-arid countries where water is a scarce resource. For example, for a few years now, Commercial farms are being developed and are expanding rapidly in the middle of Egypt's desert areas, irrigated by fossil groundwater from the Nubian sandstone aquifer system. These commercial farms are highly water intensive. They take a heavy toll on the non-renewable fossil groundwater reserves. Much like the commercial plantations in coastal Peru, the social water productivity of these desert farms is limited. They focus on export crops like Egyptian olives. However, the Center for Environment and Development for the Arab Region and Europe, an intergovernmental organization, recommends that a more socially productive use of this fossil groundwater would be for domestic purposes, such as subsistence farming, and use as a strategic reserve for a growing population. Great, that was a, a really nice video and, and a nice reminder that, you know, when we talk about equations and numbers at the end of the day, water productivity and is about people and communities and making sure that they're supported. Um, so thank you everyone for watching and thank you to all of our presenters. I think it was a really nice way to to start as what at what is water productivity look at the specifics of, of different indicators, how they can be applied in a real world case, and, and looking at the kind of holistic view of, of how it all comes together. So now I think we'll begin the question and answer session. And uh, Abraham has been gathering your questions from the chat. So I think we'll read a few out and have the expert panel um, answer them for you. So it looks like the first question uh, 
from Paul, so a question for Simon, and he said, may I use evapotranspiration as a baseline for water productivity efficiency? Yeah. Um, well, yeah, pa Paulo Castro, thank you for the uh, question. Um, maybe just to, um, uh, I'll, I think I'll start off with answering and maybe uh, uh, colleagues can take over. Um, I think it's important to, when we're talking about water productivity, uh, we should really stick to discussing water productivity and not so much the efficiency. Right? It, it is really the question of uh, with water productivity, what a plant can do with the water that is available around it and uh, that is applied. Uh, and the efficiency aspect is more about what is happening with water that is uh, not actually consumed or that is evaporated. Right. So I think it's very important to, to distinguish conceptually that water productivity, and if we're looking at irrigation efficiency or the word efficiency, that we really try to distinguish the two. Now, um, coming back to the evapotranspiration, as a baseline, I would say yes. Uh, um, generally speaking, you would say evapotranspiration, uh, you know, the, the total of the evaporation and transpiration by a plant is uh, uh, a good or the means to uh, to have uh, water productivity as, indi as indicators so this consumption of water um, so yes so the kgs versus evapotranspiration yes that's how you would see the biophysical um, um, uh, as well as the others actually uh, yeah if there's any uh, other colleagues uh, wishing to add on that um, otherwise uh, Paolo I hope I've answered it Yeah, as you said, it's just very important to, to understand that the three things are different, water productivity, efficiency, and evapotranspiration. And in terms of the evapotranspiration speaks to total consumed water. Water productivity is the ratio between output to that total water consumed. And efficiency is more of engineering or a different indicator that speaks to the total water consumed in terms of ET over the amount of water that has been delivered to a field. I hope Paolo, they answered your question. Um, a new question for Pulan from Felipe. How do you measure the water price? Is this a negative for productivity? Uh, yeah, that's a good question, actually. But the water price thing is, I mean, the, 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 the concept that we have been speaking so far has not included the water cost so much yet. So you can use the kind of do water productivity based on, we are talking about the physical amount of water consumed. But those physical amount of water that is consumed, can be translated to economic or cost of water that is that is there based on the market price of water or the amount of water that you have to spend on energy to extract that water to calculate the cost of water and then relate that to the output that you drive. So per se, say if you are pumping water from 300 meter deep with a with a with a pump and then doing a low value crop, it's very likely that your cost of extracting water and then getting to water, it would be much higher from the benefits that you gain from your yield or selling your crop. Great. Thanks, Pulad. Uh, moving on to the next question. Um, is it possible to compute water productivity in a mixed uh, crop? Yeah, I mean, thank you again for the question. Yes, it is. That is where you actually move on from the physical water productivity, by physical water productivity in terms of kgs, to economic water productivity in terms of value of that product. Imagine you have five crops with different five different yields. You can convert those values to using the market value to amount of money that you drive by selling those, or the based on the output, based on the economy curve, and then use that to calculate water productivity for a multiple crop system. Great. Thanks again. Uh, next question from Tai. In a non-water limited situation, let's say in a large river from which very few farmers are pumping water for irrigation, is water productivity not an unsuitable parameter to assess, for example, for project impacts? 
since farmers might expand their area, thus increasing their harvest and livelihood, but without yeah. improving their water I'll, productivity. I'll take that again. <laughs> so, it, yeah, basically, this is actually this is a good question, but and then you have to you you have to come to the. Uh, I mean, the, the reason we are looking to a productivity of a resource is the fact that the resource is limited, right? So water productivity by, by, by nature is more relevant to where the water is limited. And you would, this limitation could not, it's not only about the total availability of water. It could be a system has a lot of water available, but there are many sectors wanting their share of the water. So water becomes limited, will have limited availability for a specific sector. However, you have to also think about the seasonal variations. Imagine Indonesia is a country that receives like about 2,000 millimeter of rainfall a year, but through a dry season, water is limited. There's water scarcity through the dry season. So water productivity is an important factor within that period. So it's not all about, all about the, the total, num, total amount of rainfall. Is also about when rainfall comes, and then in the dry spells, do we have enough water available? So in that situation, still water productivity is an important factor to consider. Yeah, yeah, maybe maybe just to add to, to, add, uh, to that, I, th I think there's also um, uh, what I tried to highlight in the presentation is that there's also a a, a policy dynamic to this as well, right? So. Um, uh, you know, at, at the moment that uh, you're talking water productivity, then um, and and you're saying you want to improve it, uh, reduce water usage in in this kind of situation, then it, it is obviously uh, very important for farmers, but particularly for policymakers or or irrigation scheme managers, etc., to, to be aware of what do we want to achieve. What I mentioned in the president, I mean, what, where do we want to go? And uh, that has to be, you know, aligned because obviously a farmer would indeed say, well, let's increase harvest, etc., expand area. But I think that is the importance of this water productivity concept. It is that it should really bring, you know, together these different expertises and these, these different levels. Thanks for the. The two different viewpoints, really interesting. Um, and the next question, can irrigation adequacy be determined with evapotranspiration at the crop level? Yeah, I, can not. Yeah. <laughs> I will just give you a head one a tip and then, uh, yeah, uh, my colleagues could add on that. Uh, well, as it said, what is relevant at crop level is, of course, already explained by Pulad is the transpiration. But maybe if we are referring into, let's say, evaporation from the leaf, that is the interception, that could be. Uh, yeah, that's what I could say. Uh, Pulad, uh, will you, do you want to add on this? Yeah, uh, sure. I mean, irrigation by definition is an act that uh, does consider a field at the minimum scale. You do not irrigate a single crop. Unless that's your that's the plant in your in your apartment, but in in agriculture and irrigation, irrigation begins at a at, at the field level. When we speak about one single crop, this would be more about the amount of water that what that the crop absorbs from the soil from soil moisture. So there's a slight definition or terminology difference between between the levels that you you're speaking. If we take that to Using, I mean, using evapotranspiration to do adequacy per field level. Yes, we can do that. Okay, thank you. And a question from Mohammed: Could you please elaborate how the relative water deficit and yield are related? Yeah. Uh, Basically, this follows a work that FAO did in, uh, in the report number 33. It says, I mean, the, the concept is that the, the actual evapotranspiration over the, the optimal level or ETX or maximum uh, crop evapotranspiration ha is related linearly to the amount of the yield to the yield maximum by a factor we call it crop, the yield response factor, which is indicated as KY in the equation. 
The yield response factor, however, depends on the type of the type of the crop. For instance, if I if I remember correctly, for maize, KY is 1.25, and for wheat is about 1.05. So meaning that maize would be more sensitive towards yield uh, reduction if the water deficit is happening. However, you have to also uh, take into account that the this K by or slope of the relationship depends on the stage of the growth. So if you are in the initial stage or the maturity or the, the other stage of the growth, that response could be different. So you, you can find details about this in the FAO 66 report, which lays down all the scientific background and also the, the numbers that you can work with different crops. Very nice. Thank you, Fulad. Uh, for Abebe, uh, the next questions are, what are the bright spots? And maybe a few questions on bright spots. How do you interpret them? And maybe you can just talk a bit more about okay. the bright spots. And the Again, good question. Uh, well, there is a different meteorologist approach uh, how to uh, identify these bright spots. Uh, well, some identify, let's say, the highest water productivity. Uh, some, I, uh, I mean, sports areas in one agroclimatic zone, let's say, because if you compare uh, sports at different agroclimatic uh, zones, maybe it doesn't make sense because the variety, the difference could be also not only management, but also other issues. But then within the same agroclimatic zone, let's say, if you compare uh, indicators, so some indi compare only, let's say, water productivity and the highest water productivity. So uh, could be uh, areas with highest water productivity could be the bright spot. And in some studies, for instance, even by Pulad also, there is a, a recent study from 2019. Uh, of course, compare, I mean, comprising not only one or two indicators, but all, uh, all indicators, all performance indicators. That is including adequacy, equity, and others that we already discussed uh, in this webinar. So, I mean, uh, considering those, waiting, and then still you could identify the bright spot. So it means the one which had the lowest uh, coefficient of variation. But in this particular definition, or the one that I followed, is taking uh, spots which have highest both uh, yield or biomass and also water product. And then what threshold, 95%? Of course, that could vary. Yeah? Uh, and, and then, I, in fact, that's an assumption I just uh, puts a 95 percentile, you could say it's like a thumb pump, but then, yeah, 5 percent differences are, are low because there could be, uh, yeah, uh, some uh, soil and other parameters uh, and natural biophysical limitation, which maybe you cannot bridge those differences. But apart from that, the assumption is uh, the, the difference in productivity should come from management, especially in the same irrigation system. And maybe if the water is delivered, uh, well, by one uh, authority, then uh, uh, I think uh, uh, it, it's, it's important and it's, 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 it, it makes sense to compare uh, those uh, productivity across areas and also to take the 95 percent thing. Uh, well, maybe uh, still uh, colleagues could add. Uh, yeah, I could uh, I could have said a little bit. It's this 95 percentile. It's it's about a figure. I mean, it's about the assumption that among a big sample that we have in an area, some of those farms are achieving what they have to achieve. So it's like say at least the top five percent of the population will have the highest the the ET that they have to do, or will have to will have irrigated as much as they needed to. So that comes based on it's a statistical assumption that within the population, at least a percentile has to have to reach this. Otherwise, a theoretical maximum may be actually out of the reach of everybody. So it's slightly uh, using that to make sure that the, what we are setting as target or what we're setting as the picture that we'd like to achieve is even is, is achievable in the first place.
Great, nice discussion. Thanks, Abebe and Pula. Um, next question, I think for Abebe. Another question is the yield production estimation algorithm. Are they limited to... I'm not sure if I understand this question. Uh, well, uh, of course, this data, uh, we have it from Vapor. And uh, I think it's uh, maybe good to send uh, a link uh, here, uh, a methodology, how those data are driven. Because one, I, I also saw one question, uh, which is related to Albedo, if Albedo is considered in uh, calculating those data. So it's uh, uh, very explained already in that methodology. In fact, yes, Albedo is one of the inputs to estimate uh, the 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 evaporation and also transpiration and also the summation of those layers. Uh, then uh, we get a layers, uh, uh, let's say, that could be about ET, that could be about biomass. And of course, uh, the biomass uh, uh, estimation or the net primary production, let's say, layer that we have from vapor uh, is only for uh, assuming uh, C3 crops. So the only difference to translate uh, is uh, maybe to C4 crops, in this case, for instance, sugarcane, if the particular crop, the specific crop in that ground is uh, then uh, C4. Otherwise, it is just pixel specific. The data we get, the biomass we get, the algorithm works because that is the whole energy balance and remote sensing results. And then it should work by pixel, and then it should work uh, let's say for that specific pixel, and then, uh, yeah, I don't know. That's to the level I understand. Uh, uh, let me get a hand also if uh, colleagues understand it other way. Or uh, maybe, maybe yeah, maybe I, I was thinking that um, it also relates to the vapor, and if vapor actually has uh, uh, you know identifies crops uh, right in in certain areas. Um, I'm not sure if that relates, but uh, for certain areas, Vapor uh, database does uh, deliver crop maps, but in general, uh, the database does not. And so, uh, well, the parameters like harvest index, uh, moisture content, etc., are the ones that would have to be put in by uh, uh, by the users of the data, as, uh, as you explained. I have a bit of a follow-up question um, to that one, actually. So the examples that we've been using are sugarcane and, and maize and wheat, and and they there's a big change in the amount of above-ground biomass in those particular crops. Could you also use it for a crop that is, let's just say, smaller and doesn't grow as tall and doesn't have as much biomass, or even crops where much of the biomass is underground, like... Ideally, yes. Uh, use that uh, this well, as it already said, let's say, uh, the, the crop map, if it's not there from the layer in vapor, then somehow it has to be provided by the user. Uh, but for some pockets of areas already there are crop map, and then associated with that, of course, uh, you, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. all the data are relevant to that crop specific. But in general, uh, can those, let's say, layers data speak to all kind of crops. Uh, ideally, yes, especially crops where their canopy covers uh, most of the, the soil. Uh, for instance, for tree crops, it should work. It's just a, a simple energy balance. But then if they are far apart and then if there is more soil uh, than just the, the, the trees and then the crop development, Maybe then that could be equation. Of course, that also requires um, a bit of more uh, comparison and also, uh, uh, yeah, evaluation. Uh, but at, otherwise, it should it should work. Uh, yeah, that's what I could say. Great, thanks. Nice discussion. Okay, uh, next question. How do you uh, again, good question. Of course, uh, those indicators uh, that are explained by our colleagues, the biophysical, that's uh, 
the part now I am speaking to because the socio-economic is more into the Petra side. So those biophysical indicators uh, estimation could be with the supply side irrigation or it could be from water consumption side. And all indicators that I presented are calculated from the consumption side. That is using water use. The water use can be applied or it can be just a consumptive water use. So it means the irrigation supply is not considered because we approached all indicators from the ET or water consumption side. And in that, it add or it consider uh, precipitation as well as irrigation because the ET could happen from both of those what are available in the soil. Very nice, thank you. Yeah, thank you for that question. Unfortunately, we cannot uh, ensure that. Uh, I think it, it, it helps tremendously if you provide insight on how the benefits are distributed. And I think on the basis of that, you, you give some insight, some transparency. Yeah? And hopefully that m might affect uh, the policy makers uh, in their decisions. Do we really want to support local farmers or um, do, we, do we want to uh, these re yeah, other parties to come in? And it's not to the researchers to decide, eh? but I think by making these trade-offs explicit, that might help. And also to assess it in a broader uh, policy assessment framework, what are the different societal objectives you want to achieve, and does uh, a certain water allocation contribute to that? So it's not up to us yeah. to decide whether we want to maximize these benefits for the farmers, but it might help to make it more explicit, hopefully. Nice discussion. Um, another one for Petra. <laughs> Would a social water productivity be a useful metric to value a Sahelian wetland like in Mali, which has an inherent high water consumption but sustains multiple... Yes, I, I truly believe that a so social water productivity can be very, very helpful in that sense. Because what we have seen in the past is often that only uh, monetary values, which can be expressed in dollars per cubic meter, have been uh, highlighted. Whereas by emphasizing all these other um, benefits which water has, which cannot be expressed in monetary terms, uh, like uh, sustain, yeah, supporting subsistence livelihoods or other ecosystem services, which can often, which are often difficult to translate in monetary terms, but definitely have a value. So by revealing these more societal values. I think that that helps tremendously uh, if you could uh, express these. But we struggle often with the units, eh? which you, because we do not want to translate everything in monetary terms, whereas we know these things have a value. So by uh, yeah revealing these values that it supports ecosystem services, etc., or uh, subsistence livelihoods, that in itself is very valuable. I think. So making that explicit, that a certain water allocation contributes to, to these societal values, that's, that's precisely what the socioeconomic water productivity indicator is about. So yes, it is it's very helpful. But eventually, I, I would also have to emphasize that, that values are also political in nature. Eh? It's again not up to the researcher to determine what this value is. It very much depends also on what the national government wants. Eh? What are the societal objectives? Is that indeed an equitable distribution, or is, or is that uh, a maximization of uh, the production value as such for, for external parties? So that it's really political in nature. But it helps indeed to have a policy framework to make these trade-offs explicit. Maybe others want to add. Well, I think that covers it all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anyone else? <laughs> A really nice discussion. Uh, we have one minute left in our webinar, so I think this will be the last question that we take. 
Um, and then if we re will review the questions, I think many of them will be answered in, in the upcoming five weeks. Um, I see some technical questions on WAPOR and um, different questions about field monitoring. I think those will be answered in the upcoming weeks. But if there's more questions, we'll review them and try and answer them the best that we can. So the last question of the day is, which methods of water... Okay, I will just give uh, one and then uh, we'll hand it to colleagues. In fact, the question is not only about which method, uh, because it's not only the technology, it's also depend on who are the operators and what knowledge do they have and, uh, yeah, in what situation, uh, under circumstances, they are managing it. So, yeah, I, because uh, I'm trying to answer this question also tied to other questions, because they are asking, is then furrow is the best irrigation technology and so on? Uh, kind of because that's also what is uh, seen or what is let's say as a conclusion from at least for some parameters indicators uh, out of our research uh, study uh, I would say it's not really it depends in some areas you see uh, uh, that the center pivots stand out the best and in some area furrow really uh, does good if you uh, operate it if the furrow length is good uh, and and then if the management and also if the timing you know or the how, uh, how frequently uh, and also uh, uh, also maybe if you are adding other technologies and uh, mulching and knots for instance so yeah it depends on so many uh, factors the operators not only technologies uh, that's what I would say yeah maybe just add very shortly also uh, getting at this about the fact that in uh, particularly in arid semi-arid parts of the world uh, if, if there is rainfall then yeah rainfall is come yeah can reach actually up to 90 percent of evaporation right so that's it's sort of non-beneficial loss so it's really trying to focus on getting that 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 rainfall that does uh, fall to really try to capture it so really focusing on water harvesting systems that produces this evaporation uh, that 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 just immediately happens so I think it, that that should really be the focus, reducing the amount of evaporation and allowing as much water to transpire. Great. And with that, I think we will close out our webinar for this week. So I would like to thank the expert panel, Simon, Abebe, Pulad, and Petra, Thank you for your nice presentations and your nice discussions. Um, I would like to thank Abraham for all his help behind the scenes, uh, doing the, the audio and visual questions and working um, as a fellow moderator. And I would like to thank all the, the participants. It's been a really active chat. It's been really nice to read all the questions that you've had and the discussions you've been having between each other um, and the different areas that you work in geographically and within water management and irrigation. So. Um, it's been a really nice first week. Uh, I look forward to seeing everyone again next week. We're going to begin our monitoring water productivity using WAPOR. Uh, so that's week one, and then the following week will be part two. So look forward to that. I look forward to seeing you all again. Again, this present all the presentations and the recording will be available on the website. And then if you can, please fill out the survey that... Been going around that Abraham has been putting in the chat. Um, it would really help us.